uh, uh, thank you for coming to our study. We're so, so grateful. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to um, just open us up in a word of prayer. God, you are so good. You're so faithful. I can already just see just the fruit of so many things that you're doing in the hearts of women. I feel so blessed to see this room full. God, we thank you that you, you are sovereign, that you are kind, that you are wise, and that you use our circumstances for your glory and our good. And so, Lord, I just pray over this time. God, I pray that it would be your words. I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to hear from you and that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so Claire gave me a way bigger introduction earlier than I deserve. <laughs> As I was wanting to stand up and be like, I don't think I said that, but that's okay. Um, we are so grateful to have the privilege to stand before you. Um, we are really humbled and we're really nervous because we're not professionals. Um, two of us have a teaching degree, but none of us went to seminary. And so um, one of the, beauty, the benefits of that is that our hope is that you guys would see that we're not anything special. We're not better qualified than anyone to stand up here. Um, and so that what we're asking you guys to do uh, in your homework are things that we believe that you can do and that um, we want to model it for you, that God would raise up more teachers in our congregation. Um, I'm not going to talk to you for an hour, so don't worry. I heard, what, uh, I heard a couple of people kind of glance at the clock when she said, we'll start at 8, and then we'll end at 9. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just women like to talk, so we have to build in some buffer time. Okay? <laughs> so that's just, we, we say 8, but already we're late. So um, anyways, uh, I just wanted to tell you those few things. Um, so before we get started, I just kind of like to, to start off with a little story. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, I have some, some dear, dear friends that they live with us, and they have this sweet little girl. Her name is Aubrey, and Aubrey is two. And um, a few months ago, Aubrey had this little, this little wart on her knee, no big deal. But one day she fell, and she, she hit the, the wart. And um, we heard her cry, but, you know, it didn't seem like, you know, it was kind of gross, but whatever. Um, but uh, over the, the next few days, this wart became infected. And it started off as just this little bump, but it grew and grew and grew. And I mean, she's this tiny little thing, and her knee's like this big around, and she had this golf ball on her knee, and she wouldn't let anyone touch it, because if you know a toddler, if you have seen a toddler from afar, if you have ever been around one, you know they're completely unreasonable. <laughs> and, and you cannot, you can't rationalize with them at all. And so to you say, if there's pain, I want nothing to do with it. And so they finally had to take her to the doctor, which is already a traumatic experience for a two-year-old. And the doctor comes in with this big, giant needle and says, it's an abscess, and we have to puncture it so it will drain because it is on her growth plate. And if it stays there, it could, it could right now it's not terrible, but it could cause lasting damage. And if it doesn't come out, it could cause infection that could make her very sick. And so they were like, take this heavy-duty antibiotic and go home. And how about this super fun for you parents? Every, like, two hours, get a hot compress and put it on her knee and hold it there and then try to squeeze it. Like, okay, this is like terror for parents, right? So they do this, and they go home, and every time, you know, they have to hide all the things and do all the things to distract her um, because they, she knows that it's going to be painful. But it was better to, to hold, have to hold her down and make her scream to get the infection out because it is more loving to do that than it would be to let her stay comfortable and not in pain, but had this infection that would ultimately bring her severe harm. And isn't that such a picture for the book of Ruth and a picture for us? That 
Ruth is a story of God doing exactly this. He uses these painful circumstances to reveal one family's need. He takes them through the painful process of trusting him, and he ultimately brings more good from their pain than they could have ever fathomed in their wildest dreams, as we will see later that the Messiah is coming through this family. I want to say this quickly because um, I, I know uh, there's a lot of us that have walked through trial and pain, and so I just wanted to make this disclaimer. I think there's a lot of um, temptation uh, when we read the Old Testament to figure out who am I in this story, which character am I, and we try to make this one-to-one -one connection. Well, if this is what happened to them, then this is exactly what God is doing to me, and that is not always the case. Sometimes it may be the case, but, but it is not safe for us to assume we know which person we are and try to figure out the circumstance we're going through um, and, and make a one-to-one -one connection. But instead, we should ask, what does this text say about God? Because the Bible is an overarching theme, and the whole point of it is to Jesus. And so we ask, what does Ruth have to say about God? And that is the better question than what does this have to say about me? So, in your homework, we started off um, looking at a historical context, and so briefly, we're going to walk through that on page eight. Um, so, um, before we really get started, uh, we notice that Ruth comes right before which book? The Judges is the book right before it. And there's a very important clue on Judges uh, 21, verse 25. It's the very last... Uh, verse and judges that you looked up in your homework and it says in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So we know that this uh, the judges took place after Joshua. Joshua was the, the conqueror, the, the, the leader that God raised up to bring people into the promised land. And immediately after Joshua's death, one generation failed to teach their children about who God was, and they spiraled down into 300 years of moral failure and violence and disobedience to God. It just took one generation for faithfulness to God to disintegrate. So we see that Ruth takes place during this time period. We don't know exactly who, um, who wrote the book of Ruth, uh, we just know that it was written uh, after King David's reign, and we know this because of the genealogies that take place in the back of the book. So scholars would date this around 1010 BC. Why is it written? There is some suggestion that because there had been division in the nation of Israel, that with the many mentions of the nation of Israel in the book of Ruth, it might have been written to display unity and to bring the tribes back together to show that even in the bleakest times when it seems like hope is lost, that God is at work and he is not blind to bring hope to that nation. And the central theme of the book of Ruth as we see God's sovereignty, his wisdom, his covenant kindness, which is often disguised in trials and mediated through the kindness of others. God is all three at the same time. God is wise, he is sovereign, and he is kind. And we'll see that in the first chapter that Naomi knows all of these things and she declares this to be true. And why is this important? As we go through this, as you go walk through trials in your own life, why is it important that God is sovereign, that he is kind, and that he is wise? Because if we have a God who is sovereign and wise but not kind, we can't trust him. Because we don't know that he's out for our good. If we have a God who is kind and wise but not sovereign, we can't trust him because his plans can be thwarted. It is important that he is all three. I forgot the other one because I got them mixed up. So, you know, you can make the, make the, the connection. <laughs> all right. Um, so why does this matter? Why is it important for us always to look at historical and cultural context before we start looking at a book? And it's because God is showing us through Ruth that in the midst of widespread disobedience, Scripture uses the example of this tiny family, this almost invisible family in this little bitty nation, to show us that he is present, he sees them, and he is always working for good no matter how bleak things may seem. Even in darkness, God uses our circumstances to draw us to himself. And as you are using week one in your homework, we were to look through 
and notice that. How is God drawing people to himself through their trials and their circumstances? I know our, our group had really great discussion on that. I hope yours did too. Okay, so we're going to start off. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Ruth. And we're going to start looking at the first uh, verses, 1 through 5. If you're taking notes, we'll title this section, The Tragedy. And the theme of these verses that we're going to look at is that God draws us to himself by sovereignly working in our circumstances to reveal our desperate need for him. He sovereignly works through our circumstances to reveal our desperate need for him. As we looked into our homework, we'll go back to Judges just to get an even better view of what was happening in this culture. We looked at Judges chapter 2, verses 16 through 19, and the Bible tells us that these people were whoring after other gods. That is, that is vulgar language. They were chasing after other gods, bowing down to them. And we we see, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. We don't know exactly why there was a famine in the land, but we do have a clue. If we go back to the book of Leviticus, uh, you didn't have this in 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 your workbook. But if we look at Leviticus 23, God tells us this in his word when he was giving the law to the people. He says... If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you rains in in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the fruit of the field shall yield their fruit. So God told the people in Leviticus that if you are faithful to me and obey, I will bring the rain. So what do we see here? We see a famine because they are being disobedient. So God is using the circumstances in order not to just bring harshness on them, but to bring them to repentance, to bring them to obedience. And so we see this family. It says, um, And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. So we don't exactly know um, why they went. We can speculate why they went. We do know a little bit about them. We know their names. We know they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, which means that they were, they were from the city in which King David was to come and which the Christ was to come. They were in the seat of the promised land, and yet they decided that this wasn't a place where they needed to be. God had a famine, and they decided this wasn't the place that they needed to be. Chapter 2, that God calls Boaz what? Boaz is worthy. He says he's a worthy man. We've see, all also seen examples in scripture where God would say that, that this, as someone is righteous, as he says about Noah. But this family, they don't say anything about what they're like, but I think it gives us a clue because of what the culture was like. It says, hey, this was what was going on, and here's this family. I think it shows us that they also were going after the things of, that please their flesh and not worshiping the Lord. And so they go to Moab. So what do we learn about Moab this week? Okay, well, we learn that Moab was, was, came about in a super nasty way. It was the result of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. That's gross. Okay, and because of this, because of this, this nation arises that is like a pain in Israel's side. They are constantly an enemy towards Israel. They are cruel to them. You can read more about that in Numbers if you would like. Again, kind of give you a little bit of a glimpse of the kind of gods they worshipped. They worshipped a god called Chemosh, which required infant sacrifice. So this is the kind of god they were, and this is the kind of nation they were. And Elimelech, the narrator doesn't explicitly say this is a bad decision, but it's clearly not a good one. He's going to enemy territory. Okay, so they don't want to sit in the famine. They don't want to wait for God to bring the rain. So they take matters into their own hands. They move to enemy territory, and initially they're just going to do what? 
They're just going to sojourn. They're just going to stay there for a little bit. I'm just going to just temporarily till the famine clears up and then we'll go back. But what happens? They get there. It's nice right now. There's food. And so he, he is a spiritual leader of his home and he remains there. Okay? He stays a little bit longer. And then something terrible happens. Tragedy strikes. And it says, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. So these, these sons, one generation removed, they take, they take Moabite wives. The name was Orpah, and the other was Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. So they, his, their father went to sojourn. He remained, and now the, the, the sons live. They, they have made their home in Moab, and they take wives from there. And it's, the problem is not that the wives are Moabites. God is not about ethnic cleansing, or he doesn't like those people. The problem is that he knows that if they intermarry, then they are going to assimilate into that culture, and they're going to chase after other gods. The problem is the gods that the, wife, the women worship. And so they are there. They have these wives, Ruth and Orpah. And it says they lived there about 10 years. And then Malon and Chilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Naomi lost her name by this point. The place where she went that was supposed to bring sustenance and life is a place of death and despair. The place where she went to be filled is the place that leaves her empty. She is stripped of everything she thought made her comfortable. How often are when we are in pain and suffering, we don't want to learn what God has us to learn. We want to get out of the pain as quickly as possible. But sometimes God just wants us to sit in the famine and wait for him. He doesn't want us to struggle against him, but we self-medicate. We figure out how to get out of it. We don't go to prayer. I, For me, I Google everything, figure out how to learn what I need to learn myself so I don't have to wait for the Lord to give me the answers. We still have believed this lie that God is not good and he is withholding from me in my suffering. And we see Naomi here. God has brought her to a place of complete and total dependence upon him in multiple ways, financially, with her security, in all ways. She is completely desperate and sad and in grief. God is drawing drawing her to himself through her circumstances to reveal her need for him. The need has always been there. Our need for God is always there But God has to wake us up to it because we can't see it. So God in his circumstances uses these, God uses these circumstances to reveal her need for him. So then we're going to move on and look at um, the choice, verses 6 through 18. We're going to look specifically how God draws us to himself by using other believers as agents of his mercy when we are in suffering. So it says, verses 6. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law to re- to daughters-in-law to return for the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So God ends the famine. He ends the famine, and the rains come. And I love, if you got a chance to look in any other translations, the NIV says it beautifully. It says, he came to the aid of his people. He came to their aid. And the glory of the God of Israel is spreading. The word is spreading into enemy territory. They didn't have texting or social media or news. I mean, maybe they had newspapers. I don't think so at this point. So word travels fast. And where, where does Naomi hear that God has come to the aid of the people? She hears it in the fields of Moab where she's still working to provide for herself. It traveled all the way to the field. And what I see, and this is where I might cry, because I think it's just so beautiful, but I think he, it's whispering, Naomi, I see you. I see you out in the field. I know that you are there. It says in Psalm 139 that he knows when we sit. He knows when we stand up. He knows 
where we are. It says in Hebrews 4 that we are laid bare before him. Nay, God sees Naomi while she is still in enemy territory, and he goes to her through the messengers that he sends. And as we've seen, we don't know, it doesn't say anywhere in the text that the people have repented. We're still in the time of the judges. It does not, I don't know if they have or not. I can't say, but it says that, um, that God ended the famine while they were still in rebellion against him. Despite Naomi's state of heart, God still kept his covenant love to her. Her actions never affected God's faithfulness, and his love and faithfulness are personal to us as well. Our actions do not affect the faithfulness of God, even in our circumstances. So then we look on, and it says in verse 7, So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. So right now, right now we see a little bit of the glimpse of, into Naomi's theology. What does Naomi actually believe about God? So we see that she grants that God would display his kindness to them. And we looked in our homework at that word kindness that is the word has said in Hebrews. And just reading from some commentary that I had. Um, the word has said is central to God's identity. It descri- he describes himself as abounding in it. It encompasses so many aspects of love and loyalty that no word can translate it fully. Has said is covenant kindness, its steadfast love, loyal love, faithful love, unfailing love. This is who God is is. And Naomi wishes this upon her daughters-in-law. May God display his unfailing covenant loyal love to you as you go back. She knows he is that. She also knows what? That God is the giver of rest. She tells them to go back to your home and to find rest. I think it's so interesting that she does this because what is she essentially asking them to go back to? A place where God isn't. A place to go back to worship their gods. How many times have we been in a situation, maybe maybe you haven't, but I know that I have, where I've been in a season of suffering and trial and I'm questioning the goodness of God. I still know it's true, but it's true for other people and not for me. I know that God is good. I know that he is kind, but in this moment, it doesn't feel good and it doesn't feel kind and God is not close to me. But I, I still know it's true because I've sat in my GC and I prayed for the people across from me even when I was suffering. So many times God uses our trials as we talked about in our group that God uses our suffering to bring up the areas of mistrust in our lives so that he can address them with his word and with his truth. So then she goes on and she tells them further. She says, um, they, they say, no, we will return with you and your people in verse 10. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So we looked at our homework that Naomi is referencing Leverite marriage in which God had built into the custom of the, of the time that if there was a woman that was left widowed, then a, a family member, a brother could marry her in hopes that she would provide financial security for her and keep the name of the family going on. And Naomi 
whether she is saying this is just a matter of a fact, say God has done this, or she's saying it is like an accusatory way about God, she attributes her misfortune as a display of God towards her. She says, God has done this to me. She understands that God is sovereign even over a situation. And Orpah, she hears it and she's like, you know what, you're right. I'm going to go back. And we kind of judge Orpah like, you know, gosh, Orpah, unfaithful. <laughs> oh, sorry, unfaithful Orpah. But Orpah does the sensible thing. Like she looks at the facts, right? She, she looks at the facts and she's like, yeah, there's nothing for me in Judah. But if I, if I go back, I'm looking to a life of desolation. It makes sense for me to go back where I can have the hopes of maybe getting married again, of possibly having financial security. She says, you know what, my comfort, my security, my livelihood, that's, what, that's what's important. I love you, Ruth. You're right. I'm, I'm going to go. She does the sensible thing. She looks at the facts, but Ruth exercises faith, which doesn't make any sense. Ruth makes a decision that doesn't make any sense. She believes that what is on the other side, where the God of Israel is, is better for her than any comfort or security she could have if she goes back. A great Bible teacher named Jackie Hill Perry said this recently that just really resonated with me. She said, there is always more of God on whatever the other side of whatever we're facing. He is going to give you more of himself on the other side of the trial than if you go back. There's going to be greater intimacy with him, greater admiration for him, deeper worship for him, increased prayer for him, less fear of man. The list could go on and on of the spiritual blessings that God will give you if you are faithful to follow him into the places where he's bringing you. I can say for myself that that has been true. But then we go into this this beautiful response that Ruth has. And she clings to her mother-in-law. I can almost see this, like they're walking and she's just holding her. And Naomi looks at her and she says, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more so also if anything but death departs me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go, she said no more. She gives this response and Naomi's like, okay, we're going. She stops urging her to go. What is so powerful about Ruth, what Ruth said to Naomi that would make Naomi stop arguing with her and get up and go? I don't know in the 10 years what happened in Ruth's life. I don't know what she learned about the God of Israel, but these are not her own words. She did not create this covenant on her own. As we looked in her homework, we looked at um, we looked at Exodus 6. We looked at Deuteronomy 29. Another great one is Revelation 21, 3 through 4, where God tells the people, I will be your people, you will be my people, and I will be your God. He is making a covenant love. His has said covenant with them that he will be faithful no matter what. And Ruth echoes these words back to Naomi, but who is she really making a covenant with? The God of Israel. You are going to be my God, is what she's saying. And what is, what is Ruth committing to? She's committing. She's saying, I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to remain childless on purpose. I am going to never get married again on purpose. Like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to be a foreigner in enemy territory on purpose. She is giving up her security. She's giving up her comfort because she knows that the more of God on the other side is better than anything that she could have staying where she is. And what I think is so beautiful about this is that Ruth is able to keep this covenant with Naomi and Ruth is a sinful human being. She is not perfect. If Ruth is able to do this, how much more so will God do it for us? If Ruth is able to do it, 
God, who is perfect and infinite, will keep his covenant faithfulness with us. We can bank on it. 1 John 1, 12 says, But to all who did receive him, to all believe in his name, he became, gave the right to be called children of God. That God has given us the right to be called his child, and he will keep us to the end, no matter what circumstances look like. And Ruth, we, we talked about this in our group as well, they took all my ideas. Ruth was brought to saving faith through this family and the events that un unfolded. The outsider made the greatest declaration of faith. It was not the Ephrathite from Bethlehem. It was the enemy from Moab who declared God to be who he is. We can never assume we know what God is doing. We can never, even when it looks like situ the situation is hopeless and bleak, God is always working. He is always, always, always calling people to himself. Always. So God, he used people to bring news of hope to Naomi in the fields of Moab. God used Ruth to display the greatest declaration of faith and covenant love to Naomi. God uses people as ages of his faithfulness to us in times of suffering. So maybe you're in a time of suffering, maybe you're not. If you are not, how can we draw near to our brothers and sisters when they are hurting to walk alongside them and declare the truth about God to them when they cannot do it for themselves? So here we are, the return. In this portion, we're going to look at how God draws us to himself by continuing to display his love for us and his provision even when we're blind to it. So we see, here we are, Ruth and Naomi, the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So we see here again that Naomi knows that God is sovereign over all that has happened to her. And she, she accuses God. She says, God, you brought, I, was full, I went away full. But you brought me back empty. I was full. You brought me back empty, God. God has brought calamity upon me. And as we're going to see in a few verses, that still doesn't deter God's faithfulness to Naomi. Her railing against him, her, her anger, if she was, does not make God recant on his faithfulness. If that was me, I'd be like, look, girl, you're on your own. Like, I've been helping you, and you're not grateful. I'm going to back off. But God doesn't do that. God is not like us in his responses. Now, you have to wonder, she calls herself empty, but what did she think she was full of before? I think, obviously, there are some very tangible things that she was full of. She had family she had family. She was full of that. But they went into enemy territory because it was better over there. It was better than where God was. I think that there's a possibility that maybe she was full of self-sufficiency. Maybe she was full of pride. Maybe she was full of trusting in her own strength. Maybe not, but that's just speculation of things that I can resonate with, right? Right? So what did God empty her of? He emptied her of her ability to provide for herself, of her ability to, to, to rest in her own strength and her own sources, and he brings her to a place of utter dependence upon him. You know, I, I, I understand that. I know that there was a time not too recently where I, I thought I was full, but I wasn't full because I didn't trust God. I thought I trusted God, but I didn't. And God has used trials in my life to show me in his grace, hey, you don't trust me and I'm trustworthy and I'm going to lead you to a place where you see that so that you can, you can trust me. She says she's empty, but who's next to her? Is she alone? She has Ruth. She has this one who is able to display God's covenant love to her. As we're going to see later on, Ruth was more valuable than seven sons is what scripture tells us. She had the treasure of this sister walking next to her that God provided to Naomi. Now, it tells us 
in verse 22, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Ruth, Naomi still considers Ruth an outsider. She's still Ruth from Moab. And I, I'm, the, I'm the, 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 the Bethlehem, I'm the Ephrathite from Bethlehem. But God brings them back when? At the very beginning of the barley harvest. So they think it's just happen chance. God in his wisdom brings them back to a place where they're going to be full with more than they can handle. And they just can't see it yet. God in his provision is drawing them to himself and providing for them even when they're blind to it. God intends to fill Naomi in ways that she could have never thought or imagined. His heart is to fill us with himself so that we can be truly satisfied. Now, it's easy for me to stand up here and just read scripture to you and tell you that you should trust God and give you all these verses. But let me tell you, I am not the authority on trusting God. In fact, I'm awful at it. And there's people in this room who can testify to that fact because they have walked with me through really hard, dark days. Um, it's one thing to talk about trusting God, but when you're in the thick of trial, it's gut-wrenchingly hard. So why do we talk about it then if we can't practice it? Like, it's not like, hey, I can create this really hard situation in this class that we all have to go through, and I can, you know, you have to trust God now, and then afterwards you're like, I trust it, and we give you a medal. Like, we don't have that. I can't make you walk through something hard so you can trust God. Only God can bring you through that, right? But we do it now, we talk about it now so that we can build the foundation before the storm comes because you don't want to build the foundation in the middle of the hurricane. You want to have it strong so that when you walk through the hurricane, you have a strong foundation. That's why we do it now. But I have walked through the past few months of just um, anxiety that I never saw coming, health issues I didn't see coming, um, and I did not want to sit in the famine. I wanted to take matters into my own hands. I fought hard against God. I self-medicated. I accused God of withholding good from me. I believed God to be good to others, but he felt distant and cold to me. I mocked people who displayed greater faith than I. I had this friend who's like sitting outside reading a book about the gift of pain. I'm like, well, that's a stupid book. Like, who would, why would you want to read that? You know if you read that, God's going to make you go through something painful, right? You should put that book up. Um, I mean, I was angry at God. I was angry. And I'm still not fully through it. So I'm not able to stand here and tie this pretty bow on it and say, but now I'm great. Like I'm, I'm still walking through it. I'm still going to have to go home tonight and trust that God's going to sustain me. I'm still going to have to wake up tomorrow and make a choice to believe that he is good and he is true. But God has drawn me, Drew is drawing me back with his love. He has used people to be agents of his grace to me, and he is giving me more of himself in the form of intimacy with him and hunger for his word and answers to prayer. And so I can say all that I have said to you not out of theological knowledge, but out of experience. And it is true. It is true. But lastly, before we wrap up, one thing I have learned that is really important is you can't trust God if you don't know that he loves you. Like we can say that I trust God, but if you don't know that he loves you, you can't truly rest in him because you can't know that he's out for your good. So how can we know that God loves us? How do we know that? And I think there's, I mean, Scripture's written with abundance of it, but I think a, a main, a big clue would be in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. And I wanted to read you the whole chapter, but my husband made me choose two verses. So I would recommend that you go read the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read you verses 7 through 8. And it says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though for... Perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
This first chapter is just the, of Ruth is just the gospel all over the place. We see these people far from God in enemy territory. They are enemies of God. But he goes to enemy territory and he finds them. And he calls them to himself and he brings them to a place of emptiness to fill, them full him, to fill him full of, of himself and we will see him bringing them to redemption. We also are, were in a place of complete desperation, of where well, we were complete enemies of God. But Jesus came and he willingly gave of his life to buy you back. He paid the price for your sin. And just like Naomi, while she was blind to it, we don't even know that we need it, but he gives it to us anyways. And all we do is we rest in it and we trust in it. That we know, you can know that God loves you, you personally, not those women in the other group, but you personally because he gave his son for you. And if he would give up his son for you, you can trust him with what he's asking you to walk through. So I'd like to end today with just a, a short verse uh, from a, a, a hymn by a man named William Cowper. And it says, O fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. So now before we dismiss, we have each selected a song that we will have played. During this song, I'd love for you to just sit and listen to the words of the song. You can um, write a prayer, you can sit quietly, whatever you'd like to do, but just Take time just to listen to the words and just to soak them in. Um, as soon as the song is over, I'll open up and pray.